Okay, so my field of expertise is um, concerning the psychology of music and the neuroscience of music, I suppose. Um, and this is an area that has become rather popular over the last 10 to 20 years or so. Um, the reason that I started um, doing research in this field is because I was working um, at the Institute of Cognitive Neuroscience for Professor Uta Frith, um, who was very interested in how the brain changes as we acquire literacy. And we realised that um, thinking about musical literacy could give us um, a way in to understanding how a form of notation can change the brain. So I actually started off my um, research career by looking at how becoming able to read music and play the piano um, changes people's brain activity. And to do this, I did a longitudinal study taking people who had no idea of how to read music or play the piano, and over three months I taught them, and I looked at how the brain responded differently to musical notes before and after training. And I never thought of myself as really studying music and the brain, um, but it doesn't matter how you think of yourself, it, ha it matters how other people perceive you. Uh, and following this work, um, I was offered a, a, a position as a postdoc um, with Timothy Griffiths, and we started looking at more um, auditory perceptual aspects of musical experience. Um, and in particular, we started looking at something called congenital amusia. And this is um, a disorder um, that can be considered to be like a literal kind of tone deafness. So many people say that they are tone deaf and mostly they mean that they feel that they can't hold a tune very well, that they're a little bit out of tune when they're singing. But um, congenital amusia is rather different. It refers to um, an actual genuine perceptual problem where, for instance, people might not perceive um, very uh, culturally uh, typical songs um, to be familiar. So Happy Birthday or the National Anthem uh, wouldn't be recognised. And if you hear two tunes, um, to someone with congenital amusia, they may sound like the same tune. So Tim Griffiths um, and I were very interested to, to recruit a sample of people um, who have this disorder and we used um, Isabel Peretz's battery, which is called the Montreal Battery for the Evaluation of Amusia. It's really a battery of tasks where you listen to pairs of tunes and you say whether they're the same or different. And um, having used this battery on uh, several hundreds of thousands of people that we recruited via the BBC website, we were able to then invite people who scored in, at the bottom um, end of the range into the lab. And we did a number of different investigations to work out what, was, what seemed to be going wrong um, in, in these cases of congenital amusia. And we were asking questions like, what is the fundamental um, processing difficulty in, in congenital amusia? Is it a problem, for instance, in hearing a pitch change or discriminating um, the direction of a pitch change? Is it a problem with pitch memory? Um, does it extend to problems with intonation in speech? Um, can people with congenital amusia appreciate music? Um, and are there timbral um, difficulties as well? So we pursued um, this disorder on a number of different fronts and we've, we've published quite widely on that. So, so some of that research um, is available for people who want to know a little bit more. Um, that's probably all I'll say about th that um, project, which spanned a few years. But my next, um, my next grant was really looking at something a little bit different. So from people who have too little music going on in their heads to people who have quite a lot of music, so people who have earworms or tune, tunes in the head. Um, we wanted to know, this was work funded by the Leverhulme Trust, and we were really interested to try to understand why do people have music in their heads and what um, determines um, differences among people. So some people hardly ever have tunes going around in their head, and other people seem to have a report that they have a continual musical experience that, that stems from within themselves. So first of all, what is an earworm? It's um, a piece of, a snippet of a tune. It might have lyrics, it might not. It might be classical music, it might be pop music, um, but it comes um, unbidden and out of our control, it comes to mind. And then it seems to get stuck and play on repeat in our heads. Um, 
So this is the phenomenon we're interested in and we um, did a few different things. So first of all, we, um, we determined whether or not there are intrinsic aspects of a tune um, that make it more likely to become an earworm. And we were able to do this using some techniques from um, computational um, science. Um, so we, um, and it, actually it was a collaboration with the BBC Six Music radio station. So the Sean Keaveney Breakfast Show has a feature called Earworms and they ask people to, um, to text um, to say what the, if they've woken up with a tune in their head. Um, and then from all the people that text in, they select um, one of these songs to play on the radio. So I got in touch with the programme and asked them if they would be interested to share some of these anonymised um, reports with us. And from this we were able to come up with a list of um, tunes that were commonly reported um, as being experienced as earworms. And we were really interested to say, well, what do these tunes have in common? Have they got some structural features in common that might explain why they are more likely than other tunes to, to come to mind um, as earworms. And so for each of these commonly reported tunes, we found a control tune that was similar in terms of its chart success, its genre, sometimes even the same art artist, but was never reported as an earworm. And then we had these two lists. Um, this list had never been reported as earworms in our sample anyway, and this list was um, often reported as earworms. And then we were able to use um, some techniques that my colleague Daniel Mullen-Siefen has developed to ask what is it that characterises these particularly earwormy tunes. So that was a piece of research we did. And the answer, I'm just simplifying now, is that it's um, uh, a combination between um, features of a song that are very expected, but also a, s a couple that are a little bit unusual. So one thing that's unusual and causes a tune to be more likely to appear as an earworm is if it has an unusual um, uh, contour pattern, so that the, sh the sort of the the pitch interval um, is a bit unusual, for instance. Anyway, again, we've published on this, and there's lots of details um, in the relevant publication. Um, we also had a look at people who've um, we we looked to see whether or not differences in brain structure um, could explain why people um, would get earworms more frequently than others. And again, we found some differences um, in the auditory and frontal parts of the brain, suggesting that perhaps um, in uh, cortical structure um, can determine whether you're more likely to have an earworm. And this may be to do with um, things like uh, the strength of connection between the auditory cortex and the frontal parts of the brain, which we know are important in pitch memory and rehearsal processes. Um, so um, one study that we never got round to doing that I, um, I'm always very interested to know the answer to is um, whether or not we can, um, can understand uh, the functional importance of earworms. So for instance, um, I, I had this, um, this idea that perhaps um, generating one's own inner music could have an important role in regulating our state of arousal. So you know that sometimes you're in a situation where um, you need to, to be in a high state of alertness to deal with the situation that you find yourself in, um, uh, but actually you're feeling in a different state. Um, I, and could it be, for instance, that generating this inner music, particularly um, uh, if you like, um, selecting uh, tunes that are particularly up-tempo um, if you need to increase your arousal. Could this be a way of um, essentially modulating your own state of arousal such that you're um, optimally ready to deal with the, um, uh, the task at hand? So just in the same way that we deliberately and strategically listen to actual music as a way of either matching or changing our mood and our arousal, it may be that this inner music um, uh, and our earworms may be fulfilling a similar sort of function in terms of our state of mood and arousal. But it's a little bit of a difficult question to test and it's something we may get round to in the future, if we can. Now, some of my current projects um, are really addressing questions about um, whether or not music can be 
used in particular uh, situations of health management. Um, so I've recently been awarded a grant from the Medical Research Council and the Arts and Humanities Research Council. Um, and this is a, a grant that's a very interdisciplinary project um, and it involves a collaboration with um, my colleague Bonnie McConnell, who's an ethnomusicologist, also Paul Ramchandani, who's a perinatal psychiatrist, Vivek Glover, who's a biochemist. This is a very interdisciplinary project, um, with, also with my PhD student, Katie Rose Sanfilippo. And what we're doing is we are um, exploring uh, in a particular region in Africa, in the Gambia, in West Africa, whether or not traditional musical practices can be used to support women's mental health during pregnancy. And this is a particularly important area because we know that anxiety and depression during pregnancy can, doesn't always, but can have um, biological consequences for the development of the fetus. And this is because of direct um, pathways um, in utero between the mother and the developing fetus. So although we are used, we're used to paying attention to physical health during pregnancy, it's, very, it's less usual to ask about a woman's um, maternal me, uh, mental health. Um, and so method, and we know that this is particularly important in um, uh, low income um, countries because these um, effects of anxiety and depression can be really exacerbated by poverty and associated issues. Now, in parts of the world like the Gambia, there's lots of traditional musical practices that are already occurring where music is used um, to manage situations of um, poor health or relationship um, issues. Um, and we're actually trialling um, an intervention with four antenatal clinics in the Gambia where um, some, some groups of um, musicians called Kanyaleng musicians, these are fertility societies, um, who uh, essentially exist in the community um, to support other women, we are working with these women to see if um, a six-week trial where pregnant women come together with these cannulene groups um, to sing about some of the issues that they face during pregnancy and to support each other, um, can that improve these conditions of anxiety and, and depression in pregnancy. So that's a very interesting um, project. Um, finally, I'll just say a few words. Um, we're collaborating with the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery, specifically their upper limb service for patients who've had a stroke. And we are interested in how we can design interfaces um, using digital music to really motivate um, stroke patients to engage with their rehabilitation. So we know that rehab is something that once patients are discharged home, they don't really engage with it. It's very difficult, it's quite boring, and actually we can make use of some of the properties of music, so self-chosen favourite music that can be very rhythmic and entraining. Um, these are very useful properties to get patients to really engage with the re repetitions that are required to promote um, uh, you know, motor relearning after stroke. Um, so I've um, covered a lot of ground there, um, but this is uh, a very interesting area, I think, not only to think about how music is processed in the brain, but actually how we can use that knowledge to design um, approaches to support people's mental health, but also physical health.